So I'm just going to start off with a word of prayer, and then I'm just going to jump into it. <clears throat> um, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you um, for this opportunity, Lord, just to share your story, Lord, to share what you're doing in Watts. Um, yeah, God, and I just thank you for this past year that you were, um, that you just graciously brought me along uh, and that you showed me your hand at work. Um, God, I just pray that as I share, Lord, that all glory would just go to your name. All glory would, uh, yeah, your name would just be lifted high, God, and um, yeah, it would not even be about the ministry or even about Watts, but Lord, about uh, your story, your grand story of redeeming humans um, and mankind to you, God. So um, we thank you, Jesus, for this time, and um, yeah, we just submit this to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I thought I would be able to see some slides, but it's okay. You'll have to help me out. Uh, this is Envision LA. So that, like Douglas said, this is, this is the short-term arm of the Alliance, which is the movement that um, I know New Vine is a part of. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to share a little bit about the, the neighborhood of Watts and um, kind of just for those of you who haven't heard of it. So we can go to the next slide. Um, Watts is a, it's a little neighborhood in LA that borders Compton. It is uh, about, it has a population of around 40,000 in a two square mile uh, area of the city. So it's a very densely populated um, place. And it's 30 minutes from UCLA, which is where I attended for um, undergraduate. And it's just crazy that even 30 minutes away from my, like where I was, it's just worlds apart. It's a totally different place. It's a, a really foreign place almost. Um, I felt like I almost needed a passport to go in there. Um, yeah, it, it is a, um, so yeah. I, the way that I just described Watts to a lot of people, if you haven't heard of it from the 1965 Watts riots, that was kind of one of the earlier race riots in um, America. And uh, that resulted from police brutality and just ra uh, riots of minorities and um, just kind of a similar vein of what we're even hearing today, right? Um, yeah, so Watts is the way that I would describe it to a lot of people. It's just the place that your parents probably told you to avoid, or you may tell your children to avoid. Um, it's the place that, yeah, you, you probably just don't want to find yourself there at night, or um, it's there's a lot of gang affiliations there. There's a lot of um, just poverty, drug abuse, um, kind of the inner city, all of what you, I think, I think we tend to stereotype it as, um, but there's obviously a lot more beauty to it than we see um, at, in, at eye level. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So it's just a little bit of like statistics about Watts just so that um, you guys are familiar or just, I don't know, maybe even can understand, I guess, of like what um, the community that I was a part of was like. So like I said, it's a very densely populated area. There, um, it is... The median age there is 21, so it's a very young neighborhood. Uh, there's a lot of kids um, who are part of single parent households or just um, just a lot of our ministry there was actually with kids. Um, the median household income for a four person family was 25,000, um, and so that was from LA Times. And also from LA Times, it, it showed that only 60 or 64 percent of the adults have um, uh, less than a high school diploma. So that, yeah, in terms of educational um, inopportunities and in educational in, uh, um, inequalities, that's a huge one that really defines this community. And um, yeah, it just kind of shines a little bit of light into what Watts is like. The next slide. Uh, so these are that's a picture from my the the church where I lived at. So I lived in the pro, um, right adjacent to the project called Imperial Courts, and there's three major housing projects in Watts: uh, Imperial Courts, Nickerson Gardens, and Jordan Downs. These are huge, huge um, housing projects, government housing projects that were bo built post World War II. And um, so the neighborhood itself is about 61% Latino, 35% African American, and um, yeah, so it's a, it's a primarily minority neighborhood. And so this is kind of the view of the uh, Imperial Courts projects, which was a main part of our ministry. Next slide. So these are some pictures of just what I was involved in in ministry. So I was the church intern, and I just spent 11 months, honestly, the biggest thing was just learning and just kind of getting to know the community and just being friends and just making friendships. Um, a major part of my ministry was working with youth and with kids. So this is me um, on the left left hand side uh, going to a summer camp with some kids. A big story um, that really just shook me kind of my one of my first few weeks there 
was I went to uh, camp with uh, just some some elementary school boys and from our church it's this urban youth camp and um, one of the kids name is Deontay and I, I, I had just met him that day and we went to camp for five days and um, Deontay when we were kind of getting ready to go to sleep and um, I was telling all the kids okay it's De- or I was telling Deontay Deontay it's time to take a shower and uh, you need to get your clothes, you need to get your soap and everything, get that ready to go. And he turns to me and he goes, man, I wish you were my dad. <laughs> and that like hit me because I was like, oh, that's really cute. But also, it's crazy that Deontay, who had just met me that day, his standard for um, what he wanted in a dad was just me reprimanding him. You know, like I could understand if like it was just that like commercial iconic moment where you're playing catch, you know, with the with the little boy and like they come and hug. You're like, good job, champ, you know, and and, and that's when they their their standard of fatherhood. But this was literally a moment of like um, I was disciplining him almost, you know, and he 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 said, man, I wish you were my dad. Um, Deontay is eight years old, and I later learned on in, during the camp that he told me um, that his he wasn't allowed to see his dad um, because his mom had kicked his dad out of the home because uh, he was seeing another woman, and um, so he was staying in a in a motel somewhere, and he was just with his mom and his other siblings, and. Yeah, and that that kind of like this is this kid is eight years old, and he's telling me about his his parents' relationship, and I think that is kind of this story that really kind of pushed forward my understanding of what the inner city is like, specifically getting to know the kids there, because um, the kids are who grow, they are the ones who grow up into the adults that fill that community, right? And so when you grow up in a single parent household, when you grow up without a male figure or or a female figure in your life to look up to, when you grow up um, not being believed in, not being um, expected much of to go to school, to go to college, when you grow up with poor resources, low resource schools, um, this is what the inner city like as a system creates. And uh, these are the communities that they encourage by um, having a lot of these, this just a really broken reality. Um, so that was just a really humbling thing for me to learn um, and just really be a part of. And the next slide. So yeah, this is just working with the youth. Um, on the left is just uh, just the youth group. We went to a golf land and that was really fun, just kind of connecting with them. Um, a lot of stories there too, but we don't have that much time to go into it. On the right was a football ministry. So we actually... Um, just kind of opened up the space to for uh, kids in the projects, uh, young young men in the projects, to be involved in this uh, football league. And we would just come; they would come every Saturday. Um, I'm awful at football, so I was just I honestly just got waters and like helped them make sandwiches. <laughs> but um, our my pastor there, uh, what, he just loves football and he loves just creating this positive, safe environment for these young men to come. And he would just share um, like a Bible verse with them or share with them the word, and also just like let them have fun in a safe environment. And so that was a really neat opportunity for ministry. Next slide. Uh, these are the grants. So these are, uh, this is the pastor and his wife that, um, that headed the, um, church plant there called Powerhouse Church. Uh, that church, just for a little bit of insight, it's, so it's 61, it's six, it's like 60% African American, 35% Latino, and then the family that planted the church is white, and then there was me. So uh, that was definitely a fun new experience coming from Cupertino, <laughs> and also going to UCLA, which is um, predominantly Asian or white. So yeah, definitely a huge eye-opening experience there. Um, the grants were just people that I really respected and learned a lot from ministry. Next slide. Um, what does that say? Oh, the young adults. These are the young adults. Yeah, and so these are just people that I grew really close to. People my age that I just learned a lot from. Um, their life experience was just so different than mine, and I was just humbled that they even began to let me in um, into their friendships by the end. And um, yeah, it was just, yeah. There's some of my closest friends there. Next slide. Does that say community work? Yeah, okay. So community work, 
Um, yeah, this is kind of examples of stuff that we did in the community. On the left hand side, I think, is just a house that we helped. Um, I'll share more about it later, but just kind of uh, um, helping people find housing. Uh, Gentrification was a huge thing in LA, so the people in our church, actually a lot of them were moving out because they couldn't afford housing there anymore. And so um, it's just helping them find affordable housing was a big thing, a big project that I was a part of. Um, and we just kind of reached out to the community through construction work or helping mission teams come in and um, facilitating that work, or on the right, passing out food to the homeless in our area or in Skid Row in downtown LA. Okay, and then the big thing that I was a part of, the last kind of slide from ministry was, um, this after school program. So I was a part of this after school. I, I helped launch an after school program that uh, paired college uh, mentors, Christian college mentors from UCLA and USC. And they would drive in uh, one or two times a week and help tutor and mentor kids from our church. And um, that was just this awesome opportunity. On the left, I gave them a, I got to like uh, tour a lot of the kids um, through UCLA, which was super, um, just really meaningful for me just to really speak like, hey, yeah, you guys could totally go to college. You guys um, just trying to believe in them more. Um, and on the right is uh, just planting things together during our homework club and just exploring different things like that. The next slide, I think, is uh, yeah, just examples of different college volunteers that I was able to connect into this area. And um, yeah, so that kind of just shows a little bit about what I did for ministry. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and, I, and I, I think as uh, Pastor Ted asked me to share this week, I was just kind of praying over what God showed me um, there. And there's just a lot of stuff. Like, um, this is just a totally new environment for me. This is not something that, um, honestly, if the calling of God wasn't on my, like, it wasn't in my life, I would not feel anything in my flesh or anything on my own accord to go and choose to live there um, or choose to get to know another community. Um, but that was, yeah, I think that, um, God was really pushing me to understand what it meant to reach out to um, this idea of a Samaria. And I know uh, Douglas, for those of you who were last week, Douglas shared a little bit about um, what that Samaria means. Um, I'm mainly pulling from this idea in Acts 1.8, where um, the disciples, when they're first commissioned, they're called and they said um, to, go, to go be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. And that's a very, it's a very famous verse, I think, for um, people that really want to reach the world. And so we think of those four areas and how they are metaphors for our own kind of spheres of influence. So Jerusalem being our city, uh, Judea almost being our nation, and Samaria kind of like, what? No one really talks about that one. And then the ends of the earth being the ends of the earth. And my pastor, Pastor Todd Grant, he, um, when I was working down there, his big passion was, why are we not talking about this Samaria? Um, why is Samaria listed in these four places that we are to, to be reaching out and being witnesses to? Um, and so if you guys uh, may be familiar, or some of you who aren't familiar, with, in biblical times, Judea and Samaria were, Samaria were two um, separate uh, n kind of nation or ethnic groups, and uh, the the Israel uh, like the the Judeans, I think the Jews would see themselves as almost it was a stigma it was stigmatized or looked down upon to interact with Samaritans. So you're not um, so, like Samaria is this place where that's like marginalized. It's it's overlooked. It's um, it's different, you know, and it's it's a place honestly where you if you walked into you would be maybe ridiculed. You would be um, yeah, people made their way around like they literally detour around Samaria. You even though it was a longer way, so that they didn't have to um, touch Samaria. And you see that Jesus' heart is for the Samaritans just from his teachings, right? So we think of the Good Samaritan as one of the most famous parables, but also the woman at the well uh, was a Samaritan woman who um, Jesus entered directly into Samaria, which was this place that is seen as um, just a place that we avoid, right? And so Samaria is the place where we hold stereotypes against. Samaria is where our prejudice keeps us from engaging with those who, needs Christ, who need Christ's love. Samaria is where we feel uncomfortable, a fish out of water, maybe even hated upon as a sheep among wolves. Samaria is the rough and poor neighborhoods. Um, it's the LGBTQ community. It's the disabled and the mentally ill. It's people that I think are traditionally, um, to me at least, marginalized and pushed to the side and not thought of 
and that is specifically who God is calling us to as believers. Or if you, if you call yourself a child of God, that is who God's calling us to. Um, and for me, that was a huge thing because like I said, I grew up in suburbia. Um, I, I grew up in a very safe neighborhood and um, I really didn't think twice about it, you know? And then I moved then to a neighborhood where um, sirens were running by every night. I would hear like violence um, right below my window. Um, we had like, you know, theft and uh, you'd hear gunshots. You'd have helicopters flying overhead. And this was a place where um, yeah, like I, I think about even in, if any of you guys know the geography of LA, South Central LA is this place that everyone kind of uh, like makes a circle around, you know, like you, uh, if you want to go from East LA to LAX, the airport, um, m many people would not like, they were really frustrated in the early nineties, I think, or late eighties to drive through South Central or drive through Compton. And so they, they literally erected a, the like freeway 105 freeway so that you could just bypass and not touch uh, South Central. And um, you have the 110, which is another freeway where uh, people of all these different so, uh, socioeconomic brackets are driving alongside each other, but no one has to interact with each other. And you can just bypass Compton, bypass Watts, bypass South Central, um, and go from Torrance to Pasadena without ever having to step out of your car. And um, that, so that's what I mean by Samaria. It's a place that where you avoid um, and Ironically, or not so ironically, that's, that's where God calls people to. Um, that's where he calls believers to, and that's where he called me to for this past year. Um, <clears throat> and so I think something that I really, just really God kind of put on my heart was, what does it mean to reach out to Samaria? And how do we reach out to Samaria? Because like I said, Samaria is, it's a very, yeah, it is a very, um, excruciating, it's a challenging, it's a stretching, uncomfortable place to be. And it's specifically who you feel like it might be even be people that you have, have seen as your enemies or people that, um, you, yeah, you just have all of these, uh, kind of stigmas or assumptions about. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So I, I think I kind of summed up, I think four major things that really God challenged me with, um, as I was thinking about what it means to reach Samaria. And it really came down to this idea of power or entitlements. Um, and I guess the, the, the main thrust of what I'm, I'm trying to share is, the gospel of Christ is the surrender, surrendering, it's the surrender of personal power and self-preservation for the sake of the other. Because I'll repeat that again because it's a little packed. But the gospel of Christ is the seeding or surrendering of power, personal power and self-preservation for the sake of the other. Um, and so what I mean by that is that I really believe the gospel of Christ and what king, the kingdom of Jesus, when he came, what it was really calling us for was actually to, to release our entitlements, release what we feel like we deserve, release our reputations, uh, surrender our, even our dignity for the sake of reaching others, especially those in Samaria. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of hash that out into like four different points. So um, the first point that I really learned was considering others' interests above, above my own. Um, and I really pull this from this passage. The next slide is Philippians 2. Um, we can read that all together, maybe, uh, on the count of three. One, two, three. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Um, so I, I think for those of you who may be familiar with um, maybe Christian doctrine or teaching, the idea of loving others is not like necessarily new, right? And even in, in our cultural, like our culture today, loving others is not very new. But what I think was so radical about this passage that God really put on my heart this past year was what does it look like then actually to love others at the cost of your, yourself? Um, what does it mean to love others when you are put on the line or it, it comes at your own expense? And um, I think a big thing, like, so an example of that would be when um, I went to go help this lady uh, find housing and um, she was part of our church and she had four daughters. Um, her eldest daughter was shot when we, in October. Um, she was, she survived, but uh, it was a fatal, it was like through her thigh. 
and uh, just had no male figure helping her out. And she was on the verge of homelessness. Um, she was living with her sister. And um, for four months, four to, four to five months, um, I just really felt God lay on my heart, like, you need to help her. You just need to help her. Uh, you need to give what you have to help her find a home here. And so uh, I would drive, I would just spend long moments driving, um, just driving her to different housing complexes, different, uh, filling out applications, helping her, um, like, even, like, take care of her kids for a little bit uh, when her oldest was in the hospital. And um, if you, like, if, if you think that that came easy to me, you're completely wrong because I think there was this notion, like this, this huge part of my flesh was um, asking, and maybe you guys are familiar with these, some of these questions, but it's like, does this even like fit my schedule? You know, like, does this, like, is this isn't on my agenda, but you know, I guess like I can, I can help her out today, you know, or um, is this person even going to appreciate this? Right? Like I, sometimes I would ask myself that and like, she didn't say thank you, like, when, <laughs> when I dropped her off, like, it's, it's, it's not even worth it, you know, and, um, and this, so there's a lot of turmoil in my own flesh of, like, um, what does it mean to serve others at my own expense, and not even at demanding gratitude, not demanding payment, nothing, um, but going out of my way um, to consistently serve her was something that God really, really pushed me to do, um, and, yeah, I think that that was such a telling thing, especially in communities like Samaria, where I would say Samaritan communities, I'll just make up this term right now, but like those communities that I mean by like marginalized, overlooked, and ignored often, those communities are often the ones that have to fight for themselves. Um, they're often the ones that have no one else looking out for their interests. And so what does it mean to be a minister of Christ, to be a child of God, to go and serve others by considering their interests above your own. Um, I think the Philippians verse is like really radical because it says, consider account others more significant than yourselves. Um, and that's just so anti like Silicon Valley. It's so anti like America, you know, it's yes, we, we talk about service, but it's like, yes, only serve though up to like how you feel healthy or how you feel convenient. So, because up to, up to that point, or if it's anything after that point, you don't have to do it. Like, you're released from it, you know? And I think that was what was so radical about Christ's calling um, on my life and what he pushed me to really think about. Um, yeah, and so I think this was also just, a, like, in terms of Samaria, and what I mean by the gospel being this surrendering of power is that your own entitlements are, are this form of power. Like, we... we um, we always want to serve ourselves. That's our fleshly tendency. And um, like an example came in with one of our, one of an intern that came in actually through Envision. Um, unfortunately, in the beginning, it was a very hard thing for him to adjust. And one of the things that he was doing actually was during prayer times or during, um, yeah, with, with the whole church community, his prayer request would be, um, he would say, yeah, I would love prayer for just figuring out my own legacy here. Like, what am I doing here? And who am I impacting? And um, what's my legacy? And a lot of my community members would talk to me and they'd be like, I really like, don't like that. I, I don't like that he's praying about his legacy and what his interests are in this place. Um, and that was a very, like, I was like, oh, like, I stayed silent because I was like, in the beginning, that was honestly a, a big way that I was viewing my ministry there. I was like, what am I doing here? What, is, what are my interests? What is God going to use me for, you know? Um, but oftentimes with Samaritan communities, you go in and you just, you're, you're just called to release and, and just surrender that. Um, and yeah. And so I think at the end of the day, considering others' interests above your own, that's what fosters trust with the community, like, like a Samaritan community, because um, do you really desire for the good of those people, I guess? Um, so the second point is allowing myself to be disrespected. So <laughs> this was a really funny thing. Um, then the passage, I think the next slide is uh, Matthew 5. Let's read this together. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? 
Do you not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Um, yeah, this one's, I think, maybe a little more touchy, but I, I think um, our culture, I think the way that I, at least I was raised as a millennial was, it was, I mean, you guys have heard this a lot about millennials, but just kind of this entitlement, right? And like, you know, demand respect from others, you know, and you are, you are worthy of respect and, um, and respect others and like great, great stuff. I'm not saying it's bad, but I think um, even in this passage, there's like, from what Je- like from the very words of Jesus, there kind of seems to be like no respect there, <laughs> like no sense of respect for yourself in a way. Um, and what I mean by that is like when, when he says to turn the other cheek, um, that was something that I had such a hard time with. So like I said, I was the token Asian in my community and um, that a lot of times it was like the for people's first time being, um, being friends with an Asian. And so they did not know what that was like. They would make insensitive jokes. Um, they would kind of like press humor about, you know, my eyes or which I think are actually pretty big. Um, <laughs> but they would press, you know, jokes about like, did you come from China? Like careful, like he, he might know Kung Fu and like, <laughs> So honestly, a lot of funny jokes, but I think um, there was a point when I got actually very offended and um, I was like thinking about confronting this person and I was like, that's not okay. Like you can't, you can't make those jokes about me like that. Um, And so I talked about to my pastor and um, just kind of as I was working through that, I realized that, um, yeah, oftentimes when you are, are called to a Samaria or called to a place that's really unalike to your own community, um, there will be really hard times where you are ridiculed, where you are made fun of. And I think the calling there that God really put on my heart is, can you actually turn the other cheek? Um, can you actually not lash back and not disrespect them back? Um, and can you consistently show respect to those who do not respect you? Um, and that, that's a really hard calling. I really think that's a hard calling. Um, I am by no means like master of that. Like that was, that was, I think the beginning of a lesson that God's trying to teach me. Um, but yeah, that ended up being just this huge moment of like, um, but actually allowing them to disrespect me actually became this, um, I, I was learning from them that in their community that they're really about like just really quick humor, just really witty, funny, just like jabbing humor. And when they saw that I didn't lash back at them, but I, I kind of took those jokes as it was, they actually told me at towards the end, they're like, Jacob, we actually trusted you more towards the end because you were able to vibe with our jokes. Like it was almost like a testing of the waters. And I was like, oh my, that's like a really cruel way to test the waters. Like, <laughs> like give me a break, you know? But it actually became this way that um, like one of my friends told me, they're just like, man, Jacob, I just like, I see, I see goodness in you. Like, it's not like you're perfect, but there's just goodness. And I was really touched because I was like, that's not by any means what God what I had, what I had chosen for myself, but God was really calling me to almost allow myself to be disrespected in the sense of reaching Samaria. Um, so yeah, that's the third one. And the, th- oh, so that's the second one. The third one was instilling belief in people. Um, yeah. So again, on this notion of reaching to reaching Samaria or reaching others that are, are overlooked or marginalized. Um, I really think about, uh, the story of Saul and how Saul, when he came um, and he was converted, um, it wasn't like God like will open up his eyes and he just wants to go preach, right? It, it was actually funny because Saul, um, God chose this man named Ananias to go reach out to Saul. And, um, and it's this idea that what I mean by instilling belief is that I really, like God really ch- shook me up in, in how much I was willing to believe in others and empower others, um, and especially people that I end up doubting. So um, in, Samar- in, in Saul's case, he was like the enemy of Christians. He was the persecutor of Christians. He, he was known to ex- even like send Christians to their death. And when God um, opened his eyes and God turned him and, and, and Paul was converted, um, 
he was brought to Ananias and, and Ananias was so scared. And he was like, I don't want to reach out to this person. I don't want to reach out to this Saul. Um, but I really believe that God instills this sense of belief in people that are not traditionally believed in. Um, and so, yeah, I think like that, that was just a huge moment for me of realizing, um, one of the biggest affirmations of Pastor Todd and Ms. Chen, who were the, um, the pastor's family, wasn't like that, oh, they were a really good speaker, or it wasn't really even that they were, um, you know, really nice or really generous or like, um, or that they gave a lot of times. Like, all that was true, but actually the biggest affirmation or the biggest, like, um, reason why people loved Pastor Todd so much was that they believed in people. Like they believed in people that most people don't end up believing in. Um, they, they never wanted to give up on people and they would give people in our community positions of leadership where I would think in a lot of traditional churches that people would say, you can't give those positions to those people um, because like they're not holy enough or like they're, um, you know, not qualified enough. They're not organized enough, whatever it is. But he believed in people and he believed in people that, um, like I said, are traditionally or they're just used to never being believed in. Um, yeah. And so like an example of that also was this, this kid named Marcus. Um, so Marcus was my age or he's two years younger than me. And, um, he grew up like he was part of a gang. Um, he was very violent. So he got in a lot of fights during school and, um, but yeah, over a series of events, God was really calling him to, to really turn back to him. Um, but as I talked to him, his, a big thing that was just hu like a huge hurdle for him was that he, he told me, he was like, man, Jacob, I really, I really want to follow God, but I know, I know that I'm like evil. I know that I am like, I know that there's such, like, there's such dirtiness in me, you know? And he, he's heard the gospel and all those things, but I think something that God used Marcus to teach me was that people in this community and people in Samaria are often like, they, they believe the worst of themselves even. And I, the, the biggest thing holding him back actually wasn't like, yes, there was sin, but it, it wasn't the sin that was the major thing. But um, I believe that the biggest thing holding him back was himself. Like he didn't believe in himself and he didn't believe that he was able to make a change. He didn't believe that God was calling him to anything. He didn't believe that he was, there's any good in him. Um, and yeah, God really used that in those moments in, in my life and conversations that I had with Marcus to really encourage him and really talk to them and say, no, Marcus, like God has a calling on your life. God has made you new. You are a new creation and you do not have to walk in your old ways anymore. And, um, yeah, and I think that was just something that I'm really just changed by. And I also really, I'm grown like I, that I want to grow into of just believing other people more. Um, okay, and so the last point about what I mean by what it means to reach Samaria is this idea of um, being grounded in the promise and identity of Christ. Um, and so you guys might have noticed the first three things that I shared are like super uncomfortable. Like they're just like no one wants to like consider others above themselves. No one wants to allow themselves to be disrespected. And um, what was my third point? Oh yeah. And like, also like, we also just tend not to believe in others. Right. And we, I at least tend not to believe in others. I doubt others a lot. And so these are all really hard things, but the, the biggest underlying kind of <clears throat> foundation that was for me that God really showed me this past year was being grounded and be, having found my foundation in the promise and identity of Christ. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So these are, this is a familiar verse, the Beatitudes, um, but we can just read that all together. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of Blessed are those who mourn, for there is no shelter for the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall, they shall be called sons of God. All right. And so the Beatitudes, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times when we read this, we, we go like, oh, blessed are those who mourn. Then like, I should go mourn, you know, or like blessed are the, are the meek. Like I, I should be this. I don't know if it's necessarily even about 
like what we should, it's not really a command because if you notice the phrasing of it, it's blessed are those who are in this current state. Um, and if you notice all those attributes, they're all about like, it's, they're not attractive attributes by the world standards, right? Like being poor <laughs> in spirit, being like mourning, being meek, um, being like merciful, right? Like forgiving, uh, being persecuted for righteousness sake. Like all of these, I, I would argue are, are moments, uh, or they're, they're, they're conditions of powerlessness. Like they're moments of weakness. They are, uh, it's, it's a condition of, of, um, being, yeah, just see, like I said, like surrendering your entitlement, surrendering what you feel like you deserve to other people. And it's not, yeah, it's not like sexy at all. It's not something that people in this world really aspire to be. Um, but through the Beatitudes, actually this year, it came up so much for me, the Beatitudes. And um, God really reminded me of these truths that God's blessing is truly upon the powerless. And, and God's blessing are, is it's truly on people who um, are not traditionally in places of power or, or people who are controlling others or um, all these things. And so a big thing that I learned is that, yeah, we can only be uncomfortable in this world and in ministry because we find our true comfort in the promise of Christ. Um, I'll say that again. So we can only be uncomfortable in this world and in ministry because we find our true comfort in Christ. Um, yeah, so just, I guess, to wrap up, I mean, Samaria is a super hard place, and um, but I don't think God's calling us to Samaria as kind of like in the beginning when I was going through all these hard times, I would literally like, I would pray to God and be, God, what have you done to me? Like you called me into here and I literally feel like you left me alone. Um, and you're like, you know, like, come Jacob, come to this place. And then you like disappeared. Um, but what I got wrong was that God was only calling me to be uncomfortable and to die to my flesh and to die to myself because because he was my true comfort and because he was my true rest. And I think that was what I think like, it, it just really excites me about ministry to hard places because I think Christians and people who know Jesus are truly the only ones in this world equipped to go into hard places like this because we have the backing and the reinforcement of Jesus with us, right? Um, I kind of think of it like as a pivot point. Like, like if you think of Jesus as your home base and you have one leg that's sticking here, but like you can move and you can, you can kind of stretch yourself into different directions, but you always have this pivot of like Jesus as my, as my savior, Jesus as my love, Jesus as my refuge. Then, um, then we can actually venture out into places like Samaria. Then we can actually step forward in faith. If we, if we know that we can abide in Christ always, um, yeah, so this notion of Samaria and Watts and what God showed me through this, um, I, I just really feel like I, I, I think all of us are called to a Samaria. Um, I'm not sure if that's biblical, but I, I really believe that um, we're called to uncomfortable places and we're called to places that we don't want to go to and, or people that we don't want to talk to, people that we avoid. And um, something that I just like see in New Vine that I think is so amazing. I remember talking to Pastor Ted for the first time in January about it. And it, it, it's just this kind of conglomerate, this mosaic of several different people that I'm meeting here that are from all different walks of life. You know, we have professionals, but we have students, we have um, people of different ethnicities of different racial backgrounds, different classes, different, um, you know, s your, your different income levels, whatever it is. Um, but we obviously aren't in this room because we all have, like we're all similar in those senses, but we, we can come to this room and we can come as a church together um, to places that are uncomfortable because we all aspire to be like Christ and to follow Christ. Um, so yeah, I think that that's just kind of like something that I, I wanna just share with you guys and just thank you guys for letting me share with you of just this sense of um, being uncomfortable, being in your Samaria, but also finding that our commonality in that calling or what we have in common in that calling is that Jesus is our, is our true refuge. And um, yeah, we can, we can venture out into Samaria because of that. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna pray to close us and um, yeah. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much um, for this opportunity, Lord. And um, yeah, God, I just thank you, Lord, that your kingdom, Lord, is not about um, those who are powerful. It's not about those who are in um, 
yeah, who exercise their authority over others, Lord, but um, your ministry and how you call us, Lord, to people um, that are uncomfortable for us to interact with, God, um, it's because, Lord, you have called us to, to meekness, to humility, to surrender, um, and to really submit to your will, God. Um, so yeah, Lord, I just, uh, yeah, I thank you, Lord, for all that you've shown me this past year. Um, Lord, I just pray for uh, continually for our, uh, this church here in New Vine, um, that it would be a place where others feel, um, yeah, Lord, that boundaries and lines between Judea and Samaria can be broken because of your name, Jesus, um, and boundaries between people that traditionally shouldn't interact with each other, Lord, um, they are broken because of your blood, Jesus. And so uh, we thank you, God, and um, yeah, we just lift up your name. In that name we pray, amen.